welcome to this episode of Upcycling with Deb, where we teach you how to take what you've got and make it better. I'm your host, Deb Colometta. You can reach me on Twitter or Instagram at Deb Colometta, or you can go to the website, the Deb site, Dot com And there you can find out more information about me, get in touch with me, maybe even buy a copy of my book, Best Offer, Best Life. It went to number one in its category on Amazon. Um, and please take a minute to subscribe to this podcast for free. It really helps me out as a podcaster. Um, and that way the episodes are downloaded to automatically to your device. You don't even have to think about it. Um, and that is a, a great thing that you can do for free and it makes it convenient to listen. So today I have a very well-known writer for the Boston Globe. Welcome to Adam Himmelsbach. How are you? Hey Deb, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So Adam is the Celtics beat writer for the Boston Globe and he spent six years as a contributor to the New York Times. And coincidentally, he's also a Syracuse alum and he's a regular contributor on NBC um, Sports Boston. And so he's a writer and a TV star, folks. <laughs> and we don't wanna judge ourselves based on the number of likes and followers on social media, but this guy has over 42,000 followers on Twitter. Is that right? I, I didn't know you just had me on here just to pump me up, Deb. If, if there's anything else I can say to you. Can... <laughs> well, this, it, it's amazing. And I, I'm definitely one of the followers on Twitter. And if you're a Celtics fan, you've got to follow this guy too. So we're thrilled to have you here today. Let me just back up for a second. 42,000 followers on Twitter as of this morning. How did you get to that point? How Did you ever wake up one day and say, oh my gosh, I have this many followers on Twitter and people are reading my articles. When was the moment that you said, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm kind of a big deal? Well, I haven't reached that moment yet, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just pretty gradual. I think I want to say I, I started my account maybe seven years ago, 2011, 2012, around that time. And it's, you obviously start with zero and work your way up. I, I was in Louisville, Kentucky before this, so I generated an okay following there covering college sports there, um, then moved to Boston in 2015 and part of it is like as you know being from this area this is like an intense sports city yes uh, so people really have an interest in boston sports in general as well as the celtics so when there's a website or an app that's basically giving you free information about this team that you love people are going to want to follow you like if i covered a really unpop i won't I won't dump on any unpopular teams, but if you cover an unpopular <laughs> team, you're not going to have that big of a following. A lot of people ask like what the value is. You want to have more and more followers because ultimately every time you write a story, you share it on Twitter. Not everyone's clicking. Actually, very few people really will click. You can see the numbers, but it gives you an audience to share your stories directly to them as opposed to them having to go to your website to try to find the stories themselves. It's so true because even when you get bombarded with emails and an inbox, if they have a captivating subject, you're still reaching your audience. So if you do a lot of online shopping, you get a lot of emails in your inbox, even if you don't open the email, you still get that exposure. I get the exposure to the big box stores or wherever I shop. And the same is true for people. So you know, you are a brand. So people get that exposure to you, even if they don't take the time to click the article, which I can't imagine them not doing that because you're such a gifted writer, um, but you are exposing that brand and connecting with your audience. So I think that's amazing. How do you think social media has changed sports in general for the good or for the bad? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, let's do the bad first. Okay, <laughs> that's more fun. The bad is like just social media in general, there's just a lot of negativity um, you'll see just a lot of people being angry, whether it be about the Celtics, at other fans, at me for something I wrote. There's a lot more negativity generally on there than positivity, it feels like. <laughs> but sometimes that gets a little much, but, um, but it is also a cool medium. Like the, probably the best part is just this sense of community. Um, let's say you're just watching at home by yourself and 
all your friends are Knicks fans. You don't really have anybody to enjoy the Celtics game with. You open up Twitter and there's a community of writers like me who are going to tell you what's going on, give you news and information, other Celtics fans that you can interact with. And you, it almost feels like you're watching the game with them in your apartment or whatever, except you don't have to like clean up the mess. when. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because it's a way for people to stay connected even when they can't watch the game. I mean, you yeah. can pretty much live stream anywhere in the world, you know, the, your local sports team. But um, with Twitter, you get that. You don't just get to watch the game. You almost feel like you're participating in the game on a certain level. Um, yeah, that's true. I get that. I'm, I'm not, I love and I enjoy, we always have some kind of sports game on in our house. Um, and I don't know a lot of the rules or anything. I'm not very athletic personally. I'm not at all athletic personally. <laughs> um, but I feel like when I read your tweets, I kind of know what's going on. So you kind of do a deeper dive when you have that access on Twitter. Yeah, it's funny you say the word access because that's a big thing. A lot of people, like during a game, when I'm tweeting what I'm seeing, mostly that's stuff people are seeing on TV anyway, but it's more before the game when you're in the locker room talking to players, after the game when you're in the locker room again, when you're at practices talking to Brad Stevens and the players themselves. Like that's something that people come to me and the other Celtics writers or Patriots writers, and they want to be able to find things that they won't find elsewhere usually. Yeah, that's a good point. You've got the scoop, you know, you really do because yeah, you've got that access. You're like the eyes and ears for the fan. Yeah, that's a good way to phrase it, I think. And it's in real time. So you're tweeting it as it's happening and you don't necessarily have to wait for a, a print edition of the paper to come out the next day. You are sent, sharing your articles right away and um, or tweeting your evaluations right away so it's pretty yeah pretty cool. sometimes that's the tricky part too is that you don't want to you don't want to give people too much right because ultimately we're a business and you want people to read your stories and subscribe to the globe and all that type of stuff but you want to engage them enough where they feel like it's worth following you um right. so sometimes there's a little balance there. sometimes what i'll do like i did this morning yesterday i spoke or earlier this week actually i spoke with michael shrewsbury he was the celtics assistant coach and now he's in indianapolis at purdue um, or in Indiana at Purdue, I should say. And uh, I, I know there's people who follow me who are not subscribers, but you want to try to pull them in a little bit. So I screen grabbed a really cool quote that I thought was from the story, tweeted out that quote with the link to the full story. So you want to give them something, but not everything. How do you handle the haters on social media where it is so in real time and, and all that? Do you just ignore it? What, like, what's your strategy? Help, yeah. help people on a smaller scale give them some strategies for how to how to handle that besides ignore which is well, part of it very is like anybody else like i have bad days and good days so if i sometimes if i'm just having a, a bad day and someone comes at me on twitter i just block them i'd be like all right like this is annoying you're out of here like you're not gonna be able to have access to this free content if you're gonna be a jerk basically there's no sarcasm font as we say because there are times people will just be making a joke and i'll read it and i'll think they're like trying to attack me when in reality, they kind of view me as like their friend or their Twitter friend and they're just messing around. So the best advice hands down with all social media is ignore. Like if there's anything that's bothering you, don't get too swept up in it. Use it to entertain or to inform or something like that. But if it's to the point where it's negative effect, negatively affecting you in any way, it's really not worth it. One of my favorite articles that you wrote of all time, and I, I love them all, so it was very difficult for me to choose, but I loved the one with Terry Rosier and his father seeing him play for the first time. I just remember, I read, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Do you have a favorite article that you've written? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the one about Terry and his father. Like, without question, my favorites are the human side ones. If I listed my 10 favorite stories, I don't think any of them would be from a game. And some people would be surprised to hear that because that's, if you're a fan, you think that's the best part of all. Oh, you get to go to these games. Like, of course, the games are fun, but anybody can tell a story of a game. It's more the human element. Um, one that has stuck with me more because it was human, but also the impact it had was actually when I was freelancing for the Times. There was a basketball player named Kevin Lau. And he um, was a high school player then in Virginia. And he, only, he was born with one arm. He has one full arm and one that kind of goes, I guess, not short, short of the elbow, whatever you would kind of, like, he has a bicep basically, and that's it. Um, but he was six foot 10, or is, is six foot 10. He's a big guy, like he should be a basketball player. So he played and he was like, became a good player. Um, and he would catch the ball 
using his one hand and kind of clamp it against his other half of an arm. And it was just incredibly impressive. So I did a really long story about him, like everything he's overcome and everything kind of he did to kind of get to this pretty good level in high school. And the president of Manhattan University um, was reading the article in the Times that day and was like, wow, like this is incredible. And he called their basketball coach and they gave him a scholarship and he played division one basketball at Manhattan for a couple of years. So that was pretty cool. Well, that's an excellent example of how with these human interest stories, you're bringing awareness and you're letting us see, you know, peek behind the curtain. And so often, you know, I was thinking as you were talking about how people maybe um, respond to some of what you post on Twitter or articles and they forget that you are a real human being that you're not just your brand, that you're a person who does have feelings. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's important to recognize with the athletes too. So you present that side of them that people forget about. They just look at them yeah. as a number and a performer, and they forget that they have these, these whole personal stories, these amazing journeys to get to this stardom. Yeah, there's no question about it. It's, it's like we're talking about how people react to me earlier. Like I'm like 0.001% compared to these athletes. And they take a lot of heat from fans at every level. Um, and like, just like you said, like there are people too and are going through their own problems and had something awful happen in that morning and some fans at a game screaming at them and cussing at them. But there's no doubt kind of balancing that human side of things I think is pretty important. And people, I'm holding them to the same standard. I remember, you know, even watching Isaiah Thomas play and he had just had tragedy strike his family and um, just being he's so moved by that. And yet he still was able to perform. So it's this amazing capacity for people to compartmentalize and still perform it on this national stage. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, and that was after Isaiah's sister was killed in a car crash. And yeah, I think he had 50 points against the Wizards pretty soon after that. Like, sometimes it's fascinating. I don't know, I feel like if I was a pro athlete and had some awful tragedy, I feel like playing well in a sporting event the next day wouldn't mean that much to me but there's no doubt that it does like you see it time and again with people because that's I don't know that's their lives well and on the one hand it can make it a little bit more difficult because for people anyone else going through a tragedy of that magnitude you know they just don't even want to leave the house perhaps and yeah. then they see someone like that perform and you have this new standard so you might get down on yourself for not being able to to do something like that maybe it's an accomplishment to just get out the door but on the other hand it really inspires people to dig deep and to say hey he can go through something like that and he can overcome it when did you realize that you wanted to be a writer professionally Definitely the reason I got into it initially was because I loved sports. My mom's side of the family is a very medical field family, and there was a little like unspoken pressure, like, all right, one of you, I have two brothers. You guys should follow us along to this medical field. So I was like, all right, I can be an athletic trainer, you know, sports medicine. So I did an internship in high school or mentorship, I guess you'd call it. And I did it for like two weeks. And I was like, that's cool. This is not for me. Like, I don't like seeing blood and stuff like that. That's not really my scene. <laughs> And I was always pretty good at writing and, you know, English classes and stuff. So I started writing for my high school newspaper and really started to enjoy it. The stories we were talking about earlier, finding a story that no one has told before or breaking news, an important story that nobody knows about. Um, that's what kind of gives me the rush. Whereas when I was 22, it was like, wow, look at this game I'm at right now. Look at my credential. I still enjoy it. Like I enjoy the interactions. They're, don't get me wrong. Like a cool playoff game is like an unbelievable th experience anyway. Um, but as I've gotten older, it's more the journalism aspect, whereas when I first started, it was more sports. It's so funny because anyone else on the outside, we look at your life and I think so many Celtics fans would, would give anything to spend the kind of quality time that you spend with the Celtics players one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, do you, you like eat lunch with them sometimes? And, you know, you have these one-to-one -one interviews, you see them up close. What is that like? I mean, do you ever get starstruck by them or they just, you know, just feel like eh, you're one of the, the crew? Yeah, I think, the, I think the first word you said when you started off is the most important one. You said people. Uh, ultimately, you just realize very fast these are just people. Like, sure, they're good at playing a sport that people enjoy and that has made them famous. But they're ultimately, for the most part, just like me and you. My first job was in Virginia, and I sometimes covered the Washington Wizards. And my first 
um, season doing that was Michael Jordan's last season there. If you remember after the Chicago Bulls, he went to Washington for a little bit. Yes. And that I was like, unbelievably starstruck. I was probably like, if I went back and watched a video of myself, I was probably an embarrassment. Like my jaw was probably <laughs> like, I was, it was Michael Jordan, you know, and I'm like a 22 year old, like in my first job, there's Michael Jordan standing right in front of me. I was always, I asked him like two questions the whole season. I was always too scared to ask him anything. Over time, you, you know, you speak to them, they speak to you. It's just, almost, they're not really your friends necessarily because it's a professional relationship. Um, but it's just a kind of a comfortable working relationship as opposed to like starstruck newbie journalist that I was. <laughs> that was a pretty good job to have right out of the gate, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I said, I was, that was like, I was mostly covering like high school football and high school field hockey, but also I would cover Wizards home games. But yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, it was Michael Jordan. What's it like on the road? I mean, do you, you must be on the private jet of the Celtics and five-star hotels, right? Is it, is it like that? Yeah, pretty much? I'm cabin on the Celtics. They call it <laughs> Celtics one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't, um, I do not fly with the team. A lot of people, that's a misconception a lot of people have. They think I fly and stay at their hotels. Um, we do our own travel. The travel part and the road part is what I really do enjoy personally because the NBA is pretty much all 30 cities are pretty cool. Professionally, the road is great because there are very few outlets that travel. So when you're there, that's your time to really get one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with these players and get to know them a little better. Whereas when they're at TD Garden, there's like just a mob of local media there that you kind of get, everyone gets lost in the shuffle a little bit more. When you're on the road, how does it work? Do you have a deadline where you've got to write the article by midnight of that day? Or yeah, how, how do you handle meeting these incredible deadlines and turning out quality pieces? Yeah, it just depends what is going on that day. So if, if they're, let's say a game day, um, which is most common on the road, obviously, uh, usually they'll have what's called a morning shoot around. So if the game is at seven o'clock or whatever, they'll have like an 11 a.m. shoot around and shoot around. It's just like a mini practice. If that starts at 11, we will go at 10.30. And I say we, I mean me and other media members. It's a short availability time, but you'll usually ask, find out about what's going on with guys' injuries. If there's a longer project you're working on, you have a few minutes to kind of get some extra information for that. You talk to Brad Stevens. You go back to your hotel and kind of have usually the rest of that day, either if something came out, shoot around that was important, I'll go and write right away if you have a little breaking scoop or anything like that. Then you have a few hours to kind of hang out. So that's either nap time, which is very big in both well, among NBA players and journalists, because we have such weird hours with traveling and working late. And then around, if it's a seven o'clock game, at 5.15, you'll start doing interviews again. Then I'm writing as the game goes along. I'll hit send. We have until 12.10 to send my final version for the last Boston Globe print edition. We talk on the show a lot about taking action. So if you want to accomplish a dream, what are the action steps that you need to take? You've followed your professional dream and that's being a sports writer and getting to know these people and getting to travel and receiving all these benefits that come from the nature of your job. What's some advice that you would give to somebody who's maybe looking to follow a professional dream? You need to put it in the work. You need to make yourself stand out from others. For journalism specifically, which what I obviously would uh, get this question a lot from young writers as I'm to talk, talk to college students and high school students and they almost always say hey I want to cover the NBA how do I cover the NBA and I tell them that that's not the right question to ask you should be asking like how do I become a journalist or any sports fan would love to kind of go to all these games and things like that but if that's your only reason to want to do it if you're not in it for loving the craft of writing and storytelling you're not going to be good at it. It's not going to be a good match anyway. And then you progress and you put in that time. And at, like I was telling you earlier, I grew a passion for writing from that. Um, it's, I think it's much more important in my field to have a passion for writing than to have a passion for sports. Um, which, again, 22-year-old me, if some 40-year-old guy told me that, I'd have been like, oh, be quiet, old man. I, love, <laughs> like, I, love, I just love my sports. But I think it you know, obviously it's good to have a, it's good to have an interest in sports as well if you want to be a sports writer, but I think really liking the journalism and storytelling aspect of it is important. And then to broaden it for any, any field is it's hard work and really just being disciplined and um, setting yourself up to be like the best at whatever you're trying to do. It's so true because I feel like I feel like I've done a lot of things in my life for free, you know, where you were talking about that internship where you got exposure to the Syracuse University team and um, 
that to me is key. And a lot of times I think even kids say, well, maybe that would be a cool thing, but I only want to do it if I get paid or you have to put in the work. There's really no shortcut to it. And maybe it's not exactly what you want, but you can always search for opportunities and, um, and, and chances to perfect your craft. And even now, I mean, one of the benefits of getting a little older is that I feel like the pieces are all starting to come together. Everything's coming to fruition. It's, it's kind of nice to be at this point where I put in the work and it's taken years and years and years. And now just being able to not just lay, let that lay dormant in my past, but to be able to bring that to achieving a dream. So it's so important to take action, but all along the way, even if you can only chip away at it, yeah. try to practice what you think you're good at and you never know what opportunities might come up. And when they do, you'll be ready. Yeah. that And, and, and challenge yourself to like, don't just put in the motions of, all right, I, I'm going to, do this job for two years because I get like, make sure you have value in what you're doing. Make sure it's, if you have a goal, make sure what you're doing now is helping you get to that as opposed to just putting a time on it. Like, oh, in three years, I'll be ready to do that. Well, okay, spend that three years getting yourself ready to do that, I think is more important. Absolutely. It's how you spend the in the meantime that's yeah. important. Great. Well, Adam, thank you so, so much. This was just no problem, an though. honor for me. And what I talk about in my book, Best Offer, Best Life, for sale good now, um, that <laughs> is you're creating a different kind of wealth. And maybe, you know, no matter what your paycheck says or your bank account, you are having these experiences that people with plenty of money can't necessarily buy. And that's something that, you know, you're, you're able to not judge just based on a paycheck on a job, but you're looking at the overall picture. And this is setting you, sub, setting you up for whatever your next step is, and it will catapult you into new things. So being able to have that attitude of looking at the true value of it, which is what you mentioned, versus just the metrics of what you can, you know, officially measure. Very important when you think of success. Yeah, that's a good point. That's true. Great. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Can you give your Twitter information? It's just at Adam Himmelsbach. Perfect. And I'm what not. I'll do is I'll spell it out on the screen for people who are watching this. And I will be sure to put it in the show notes so that people can just open the show episode and scroll down and they'll be able to tap on it and connect with you right away. And I recommend that everybody does that and follow Adam because he is an amazing writer. And I've been so inspired by his stories. He's a just a beautiful storyteller and you will really enjoy reading his articles. So I know you're a busy guy. Thank you so much for spending the time with us and giving us the behind the scenes. No problem. You've been listening to Upcycling with Deb. I'm your host, Deb Colometta. Again, I can be reached on Twitter and Instagram at Deb Colometta. Remember to subscribe for free to Upcycling with Deb so that you can get the latest episodes automatically downloaded to your device. And we'll be back next time with more tips, tricks, and hacks on how you can start upcycling to live your best life. Sorry, that just went on. I think we should leave this in. I feel like people like outtakes. <laughs> That's true. It's more, it's more human. I'll put it at the end. Yeah. <laughs> okay.